All right, Mike, I am super pumped because we have probably one of my favorite players of all time for UCF. Um, this guy was part of some of the biggest memories, the biggest moments of UCF history. And uh, and we are really glad that we were able to track him down and get him on the show tonight. Happy to bring in quarterback for UCF 2017 to 2020, Daryl Mack Jr., a.k.a. DJ Mack, on the show. First off, DJ, good to see you, man. Hope all is well. Thanks for joining us on the show tonight. Thank you guys for having me. It's a pleasure to be up here finally you know what i'm saying after you know like you said trying to track me down <laughs> but it's been a no. thank you guys no we appreciate it man and uh and we're, we hope all is well man we'll get into a bunch of stuff in your career but i always like to start off at the beginning uh you're a kid out of virginia uh that's a far away from florida right 2016 you're doing the recruiting thing and you decide to commit to ucf what brought you down to orlando what made you decide that you want to be a knight um yeah uh Starting off my senior year, uh, kind of recruiting had died down a little bit. And uh, I remember getting a DM from then the coach, uh, Mario Verdusco. And uh, he texted me. And uh, I think I was in Orlando probably that following week and um, came down here for – it was a homecoming game against Temple that year. Yeah. And they scored – We lost that one, too. We lost that one, too. Yeah. Lost yeah. That one too. yeah. yeah. Um, went to that game – kind of fell in love with campus, you know, how everybody say what for me, it was uh coach frost and just the whole, and just that whole staff. It felt like, felt like home. They made Orlando feel like home. They made UCF feel like home. So um, kind of got back to Virginia, talked to my parents and was like, yeah, I think, I think, I think this is the one. So. What other schools were you considering? Was UCF your top choice? Were there other schools you were thinking about? Um, Temple, uh, West Virginia had ended up showing kind of interest early on. Um, and then Georgia, uh, Georgia Tech ended up showing interest kind of late. So those were the, those were three ways I was kind of thinking about going. That but, first season. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> that first season was pretty magical. You had a front row seat there for the perfect season. What was that like as a young guy being on that team? Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Coming in, kind of no one knew what to expect. Um, they were coming off being six and six, but uh, we felt just kind of, kind of felt like something special was going on. So, as the practices was rolling on during camp, um, like usually for high school, for high school athlete, college practice, their first college practice is like a lot faster. But man, like you could see the talent that we had early on, and I think as we just won, you know, three, four straight, I think we knew kind of what we. What we had a chance to do, it was all if uh, we could just come in and pull it all together. And, man, it was magical to see how the pieces ended up fitting in, you know, just mag like perfectly for that year. So I couldn't act. <laughs> I don't think anybody could ask for a better first year. You probably thought you were never going to lose a game ever for a while, right? Sure, never. Like, <laughs> and, you know, you know, usually a college guy coming in from high school, you know, middle school, you never really lose that much. So it was like high school, I never really lost. And then college, like that was my first year of college. So you kind of get kind of get um like spoiled, you know what I'm saying, tough style. So yeah, that, that year was great. <laughs> what was the role of being a scout team player like? What a lot of responsibilities every week for you? You had to yeah, always, learn the other teams? Always a lot of responsibilities. And I know freshman year, I got lucky and Noah got lucky. You know, we traveled to every game. We were all in all of the meetings and stuff like that. So I had to, you know, be vocal and be present for those meetings. And then scout team is really just, you know, kind of locking in to being someone else for the week. So I just try to do my best to to just kind of take give, uh, get the looks that coach was getting and making sure I was, you know, trying to complete the passes and trying to get trying to get better on my, you know, like just there. Because scout team is – you're not a lot – you're not with your coach a lot. So – Around that time, is just trying to get mechanically better and just trying to get used to the like the pace of college football. So, I was one of the lucky ones, though. Well, like I said, you you were a young player and you came to UCF because of Coach Frost and Coach Verduzco. And then that season ends, and all of a sudden you hear they're leaving. Right, they're going to go to Nebraska. They're leaving. What were your emotions like at that point? Right, you committed to play for those guys, and they're leaving. You're a young kid. You hadn't yet stepped on the on the field yet. What were your thoughts as you heard that Coach Frost and that staff was going to be leaving? Right. Well, being a young guy, you're kind of kind of upset because it's kind of like that's what you set your yourself out to do. You try to set yourself out to go play for this person or whatever. But I honestly, 
from when I heard it happen, I respected his decision. We we've like as that team came together, you know what I'm saying? It was because of Coach Frost, the way we, you know, kind of jailed as a team came a brotherhood. And uh I think we all kind of we were upset with the decision just because the year that we had, but we also respected it as a man and you know, as men growing up, you know, as you know, emerging adults, seeing him taking the steps to, you know, try to be better for ourselves, we couldn't couldn't blame him for that. Was there any, any any thought in your mind about maybe evaluating your choices and deciding if you want to do something different at that point? Um, no, I think I was I was I was locked in. I was locked in at UCF by that point. Well, then Coach Heupel comes in, right? And obviously, he was known for having a high powered offense in Missouri and spent some time, obviously, at Oklahoma and Utah State as a quarterback, as a player. What did, did you have to do anything to evaluate his offense to figure out, like, hey, is this going to be a good fit for me? Was there something that you had to do to kind of understand if you felt like Hype was going to be a good coach for you? Um, no, nah, coming in, Hype, uh, Coach Hype already had his name. He already had his, you know, guys that he's coached and went on and did things in college and in the NFL. So his name spoke for itself. Um, we kind of, kind of the things that stayed the same was like his pace. And, you know, we kept certain concepts in. So that was really something that I liked within the offense. And then I also seen how Coach Hype came in and kind of, also tweak things to the to McKenzie and you know to other players on the offense. So, well, how, yeah. how excited how excited were you too? Because I mean, not that you want to lose anybody, but Noah Vedrill decided mm-hmm. to go to Nebraska at that point, right? So you were you were essentially in QB two at that point. How excited were you at the at the realization that you had moved up the depth chart and that you would essentially be the backup potentially in twenty seventeen or twenty eighteen? Right. Um, well, going into that year, it was kind of we. Like when Frost left, we kind of didn't know what was going to happen after that. We were all kind of not to say in the scramble, but we were all just wondering what was going to eager to, uh, to, you know, see what's coming next. And uh, when I heard that news, I was just in the mindset at that point, just trying to stay ready, you know what I'm saying, for for my guys and whoever needed me. Um, yeah, miss Noah a lot. I, I honestly didn't think Noah was going to leave. I didn't know. I, when, he, when I found out that news, I was kind of shocked myself. But, yeah, I was just trying to stay ready for the guys. I think Hype will try to keep things pretty similar to Frost, but what were some of the biggest differences between the, the coaching staffs? Um, not really. I don't want to say differences because, you know, coaches all got, got their own certain way of coaching. But uh, Hype, Hype was different in a sense of, like, with Frost, it was kind of more laid back. You know what I'm saying? Like, like time, like we – for Frost to say, for instance, for Frost, we had to be in five minutes early. You know what I'm saying? But if a guy got in four four minutes and 30 seconds, it's not that big of a deal. You know what I'm saying? We started meeting in five minutes. With Hype, Hype came in and he kind of was a lot more strict than, you know, just certain things like that uh, on the team. And, you know what I'm saying? He's trying to just, like develop his own culture. So he was a lot. Yeah. Well, you got to play opening night against UConn in UConn and you break off a 70 yard touchdown run. How cool was that on your first uh, college? game experience to score a touchdown like that it's um it's honestly almost unbelievable because i didn't think like going into that game you're not thinking like oh yeah you know what i'm saying you're going in to play like or that your first run is going to be the run you know what i'm saying like the, the run of the game the longest run of the game so you're not really going into thinking that but uh when i when i caught the snap and kind of took the read i kind of knew i was going to pull it um but i thought i was gonna have to make someone miss you know what i'm saying run out of bounds but as I like broke through, I broke through the first line and I kind of, I looked to the right and I didn't see anyone. So I'm, I, I didn't like, as I'm running, I'm just like, man, let me not get caught. Let me not get caught. Cause I know if I, at that point, if I was to get caught, that would have been the worst thing ever. I probably wouldn't have been, li- been able to live it down. So yeah, it's just, it was the second longest run by a quarterback at that time. And you're okay. wearing number eight. And, and you know who wore number, did they, did you know about Dante? Yes. Did you know that he yes, wore number eight before you took Nobody said anything when you took that number and said, hey, you look like Dante? Because uh, to, on like, that play, to me, you look around, like Dante. When you walk around certain places, like with UCF fans that really know what they're talking about, they you know, they throw little shots like that. They, they let you know. but um, Or they let kind of let you know you got big shoes to fill. So that's that's kind of what that was. When I saw you take off like that as a true freshman, I said, oh, my God, here's Dante. Because Adam and I were at school when Dante was in school. I was like, man, I'm having a flashback here. That was awesome. Right, right. Appreciate that. <laughs> Well, you had a front row seat, obviously, to watch Mackenzie Milton play, obviously, in 2017 and 2018. Um, how big a role did KZ play in your development as a quarterback? How much did you learn just from sitting in rooms with KZ, watching him play, sitting on the sidelines? How how big was he in kind of your growth as a quarterback? Oh, man, KZ played a big part in my growth because KZ kind of 
Cause he kind of taught the how to make the game fun for me. You know what I'm saying? He taught me how to learn just everything about football. He taught me how to learn in ways that was gonna benefit me the best. You know what I'm saying? Make plays that was gonna benefit me. Put myself in positions that's gonna benefit me. Like he helped me with all of that. So just his, you seen, you guys seen Casey play a lot of, <laughs> a lot of his plays, a lot of his biggest plays in his career are plays that. You know what I'm saying? He called for himself at the end of the day. He got to scramble out, make a throw here, make a guy miss, make a throw here. Those are the biggest plays. He kind of taught me how to how to do that, but stay within my means. So, yeah, I thank KZ a lot for that on my development. Yeah, obviously KZ did a lot of great things, a lot of great plays. I think one thing that McKenzie probably doesn't get enough credit for is how tough he was. Right. And we saw that in that 2018 Memphis game, right? We knew he was hurt. We knew he was banged up. Helicopter touchdown. But everyone in that game, DJ, is going to remember – the fourth and one play where Heupel says, let's go bone, right? You're on the sidelines, right? You probably have a headset on. Maybe you're hearing the play call. It's fourth and one on our own 29. And Hype says, let's go for it. Fourth and one. Let's go bone. What was your reaction to the sideline when you realized that, my goodness, my coach is going for this one right now? So just the just for the flow throughout that game, we kind of see how that we got we kind of seen how the game was going. We kind of seen that it was going to come down to the final, you know, final couple minutes of the game. And uh at that point, uh, when it was four from one, we we kind of we kind of uh, I think the first play we got a good run play, second play we kind of stalled out, and then third down we kind of stalled out. Or right, we got to the uh, we got within one yard, and we knew like all right they haven't been stopping us on anything short all game. Like we knew we were gonna get it. So when when hype called bone, we <laughs> bone get it like we get in the bone. Let's go, let's go, let's get let's finish this game. Let's let's get it on. So everybody was ready. Nobody kind of – nobody. everybody stepped up to the challenge. Everybody was ready. Even the sideline was ready when he said that. So we knew we were going to get it for sure. Yeah, that was an incredible game. But like we said, McKenzie gets banged up. And the next week we go to East Carolina, and all of a sudden you're starting. <laughs> how, how many days before that? Because it was a big secret. I remember McKenzie mm -hmm. was warming up before the game. He had pads on and everything. And then you came out with the start. Did you know in advance that you were starting that game before that day? Um, well, like you guys speaking, speaking on KZ, KZ played that whole year, you know, kind of banged up and no one even knows it. That's a, that goes to show how tough KZ is. You know what I'm saying? KZ always had you know, little tweaks with his shoulders, just, you know, just small, little different things like that. But, uh, I probably found out, I want to say Wednesday, cause Wednesday is our last padded practice of the week. So, um, probably, yeah, probably like Wednesday night. I found out Wednesday, Wednesday night. Uh, right before, because the next day is the walkthrough, and then we do jog through on Friday. So, yeah, I found out uh, going into that week on Thursday. And what's going through your head that week? How nervous are you? I mean, are you prepared? You think you know the whole playbook? You ready to go? Uh, well, preparation, like, on that piece, like, I was always trying to make sure I was even ready to go, just just in case I had to, you know, strap in the helmet and take, take snaps for KZ or anything like that. So I was always trying to, you know, just – Key in on the key in on the weekly game plans like I like I was gonna play. But when he told me that it's kind of it's kind of different starting the game and you know preparing to start or preparing like you're preparing to start. That's how I think of it. It's it's way different. And uh I was just trying to make sure I was ready, just trying to make sure I at that point we were still winning, we still haven't lost. So I was really just trying to make sure I was going in and there and doing the best I can to, you know, keep the streak, keep the streak going for my guys. DJ, I don't know Coach Heupel at all. I've only, I don't think I've ever met him one time. But one thing I can tell about Coach Heupel is he liked to keep secrets. He was always very cagey, would never tell you what's going on, right? Ooh. Always, everything was everything was always a big secret with Hype. So you find out Wednesday, you're starting that game. I'm sure you want to tell your parents, right? I'm sure you want to tell your boys, you want to tell your friends. What do you do when you find out you're starting, but yet you know Heupel doesn't want anybody to know? How did you handle that week? Right. Uh, well, I didn't tell me not to tell anybody, but I was still trying <laughs> to keep okay. a secret. But me being a high school, like, uh, like a second year guy, East Carolina is four hours from my house. Like, I want to tell everyone. Like, I'm, <laughs> I'm trying to tell everybody from the house. But now, nah, um, I just try. I know my, my parents are going to come to every game. Um, even before they knew my high school coach was going to come to the game because he he went to ECU and it was there it was there uh I think they had like alumni night where it might have been a homecoming or something so I knew he was going to be at the game and my offensive coordinator from high school was already going to come with my parents to the game so honestly those were the those were the people that I needed there and uh you know what I'm saying I can I couldn't ask for a better you know group of guys or a group of people that could see that so 
I wanted everyone there, but had to <laughs> had to keep the game plan, the game plan. So. <laughs> well, obviously, we got to win that night. And then a few weeks later, college game day comes rolling into Orlando. Cincinnati comes to, to town, obviously, college game day, national broadcast. Was that the craziest atmosphere you were a part of at UCF, that college game day experience? Now, you were there in 2017. So you were there for the Cows game on Black Friday with the Mike Hughes mm-hmm. return. You yep. were there, in, obviously, for the championship game with Trey Neal and the interception. Yep. Was that the craziest game you were a part of at UCF, that this the atmosphere in the crowd in that college game day game? Uh, like you said, I've been a part of a lot of those games, but that Cincinnati game – was probably the loudest. It was probably the loudest that I that I've seen it get. Like Memphis was loud. Both Memf- uh both times we played Memphis was loud. USF was loud. US- USF got really loud, but that Cincinnati, I don't know. It just felt different Cincinnati. I think it was just because it was more people from more people getting to see what UCF was really about. So I think that that's what made it the, I think that's what made it the best. How how much pressure did you guys feel that season? Obviously, 2017, you go undefeated. 2018, you're off to a good start, right? The season's rolling on again. We keep winning. We keep winning. Was there a lot of pressure around you all to keep that streak alive, to keep the winning streak kind of going? Did you feel a lot of pressure as that season went on in 2018? Um, I don't think we felt pressure, but I also feel like we didn't really – like I don't. I feel like now we know what we did like as a collective those two years, but I don't think like as we were going, we didn't really, we didn't really understand what we were doing. You know what I'm saying? We're just going out there and basically doing what we were coached and we were doing it well. You know what I'm saying? We were all, we had to like those two years at UCF, like probably the most talent has been, you know what I'm saying? Like that, those guys, those, we were though, we were, we we were very, that both teams were very talented. So we knew, we knew we had what it take, we had what it took to, uh, you know, kind of get things done, but I don't think we knew what we were doing until, you know what I'm saying? We come back around UCF and, you know, fans are, you know what I'm saying? Telling us like, Oh my God, I remember when you did this. I remember we, that's cause I know that's when I felt like, okay, like, all right, yeah, we, we actually did something back then, but back then it was just practice game. You know what I'm saying? We're trying to go out there and play our hardest. So after the Cincinnati game, we go to Tampa and the, the the game that everybody remembers for the for a horrible reason when KZ gets hurt, mm-hmm. just being there on the sidelines, seeing him and the pain that he's in, how hard was it for you to focus and, and go into the game like that, knowing that he was in the, in a lot of and a lot of pain and really had a chance to lose his leg at that at that point. Yeah, um, at that point, me and KZ were really close. You know what I'm saying? He was my when we go to the away games, he was my roommate in the hotel. You know what I'm saying? So. Just here, you can kind of, and, and you know, during those times, those are you're you're just you and him in the room. Like Aaron, there's no one else in the room, so you just you know having those conversations with somebody, you know, what I'm saying, it really develops a relationship. So I really built a bond with him, and it wasn't necessarily the fact that he was, you know, what I'm saying, not gonna be able to play anymore, or you know, what I'm saying his knee was hurting him, and it was just the fact that I know what we used to talk about and seeing this happen to him, it, it really hurt me. Like my mom wasn't even during the game, like I would like kind of have to lock myself back in because my mind would go to KZ, you know what I'm saying? So it was real hard to deal with. Um, but I knew like, I knew we were like during that time, we kind of had, we were getting the momentum back in the game before he got injured. And uh, like, I just had to keep the offense rolling. Like, that, was, that was my job. I just had to go in there and keep the offense rolling, try to keep the guys heads up. You know what I'm saying? Just keep reminding them that you know what I'm saying now we have something to do it for. Like, we were winning those games. We were winning those games kind of for us. But now we have a like a real reason to to really try to finish what we, you know what I'm saying, what we had started. So and the tell me about that week after that game leading into the championship game. There's no doubt about it now. You are the starting quarterback. It's your team. What's going through your head? Are you, how, how's preparation for that week? How are the guys in the locker room treating you? Yeah, um, well, first off, I gotta give a shout out to the guys because in that locker room, like they never they never made me f- like they made me feel like when I got to the starting role like that I've been there all year. They, you know what I'm saying? They treat, everything was the same. They didn't go any try to treat me starting type of ways and you no, know, you know what I'm saying? No, nothing. So we just came in the locker room every day. Um, they kind of gave me the confidence. You know what I'm saying? They come up to me say, you know what I'm saying? Come on, you, you know what I'm saying? This is you because you know what I'm saying? They see it in practice every week that I was going in. You know, running with the twos and completing the same game plan. You know what I'm saying? So it was really just I had to shoot lock in because at that time like after the usf game um we went to go see kz um didn't see him that first night so i ended up staying another day 
So I didn't end up getting back to Orlando till, you know what I'm saying, Sunday night. So, yeah, my, I was just trying to get my mind, you know what I'm saying, right, trying to, you know, keep the keep the game plan, keep the guys all calm. It's a big week regardless if I was a starter or, you know what I'm saying, if I was a backup. So, you know, that was kind of my job anyway, to keep the guys calm, you know what I'm saying, just give them the confidence and the plays that they can make. And, uh, like, this time it was just on a, a broad and uh, like a more broad level. Yeah, how, how emotional was that, DJ? Obviously, before the game, everyone's wearing lays in the crowd, right? I know Snelson snuck a lay underneath his jersey <laughs> and his shoulder pads, right? How emotional was that as you guys run on the field? Obviously, you know, Casey's not there, to your point, a big game. How did you kind of keep your emotions in check? Because I imagine you're probably all over the place, right? You're excited, you're sad, you're nervous, you're anxious. How did you keep your emotions in check like that? Right. Um, well, uh, earlier that day, as we were in the hotel, I kind of had my mo- – KZ, ESPN put KZ on the screen. He had like a Christmas message or something like that. And I, I think I was the only one in the room, and it got to me. But I was, I'm was, i like, I'm glad that got to me because I didn't have that moment when I got to the stadium because, you know what I'm saying, I already had had it. But the amount of love that Night Nation showed for KZ like that day, just throughout the day on Inst- – uh, just, you know what I'm saying, you see ESPN, you see us coming to the stadium, everyone got lays on. Like, how did everyone get lays? Like, what's going on? Everybody in the stadium has lays. So seeing that, that, that kind of, uh, like, put his impact into perspective for us, definitely for me. So I just wanted to, like I'm saying, like I said, go out there and make him proud. Well, that, that game got off to a bit of a rocky start, DJ. I think Daryl Henderson may still be running for touchdowns right now because he was running all <laughs> over the field early on. Uh, you had a couple of unfortunate turnovers, two fumbles, mm-hmm. another fumble that gets recovered in the end zone, obviously, for a touchdown. What what were you doing on the sidelines? What were coaches and teammates saying to you? Again, I know you're probably jacked up. You're excited. You know, your game plan wasn't to fumble the football, right? But how are you kind of keeping yourself in check? And who's kind of coming over to you being like, all right, young fella, like, we got you. You're good. Like, who were those people that rallied around you on the sideline? Yeah, um, well, always going back to the huddle, you know what I'm saying? After you go back to the sideline, sitting in the chairs and stuff, your quarterbacks are with you. So Quad and Hayton, Quadri and Hayton, they were always – like I'm because I'm kind of the lighthearted guy out of the group. Like I'm the one who's kind of keeping everybody calm and like that kind of thing. So uh, like my hardest thing was just trying to – because I knew like I had to get right, but I also – didn't want to beat myself up. So I was trying to find a happy medium to like staying happy because you don't want to be happy if you just turn the ball over, but keeping your mind in the game, you know what I'm saying? Not trying to think on past events. I was trying to find a happy medium, but uh, like I say, a quad, quad, Gabe, Marlon, Otis, um, yeah, Hayden. Those were the kind of the guys that just come up to me kind of like after every drive and it's just like, all right, look, you know what? You kind of, <laughs> it's crazy because Marlon, Marlon's kind of my guy. So he was like, he came up to me and he like nudged me on the side. He's like, look, man, you can't do any worse. So, <laughs> so after that, uh, I was kind of good to go after that. After we talked in the locker room, everybody came in the locker room and uh, he kind of nudged me on the side and said that to me. I'm like, all right, well, come on. We, we only got up from here, so. Yeah, take us in that locker room. So there's another iconic moment right before halftime where Hypo comes out to check on somebody. He does that that hand motion, right, where he kind of gets the crowd pumped up. Everybody starts standing up or whatever. You kind of felt a little momentum at that point. You go in the locker room. You're down 38-21. What did you all talk about in the locker room? What did you say in that in that brief, like, 10-minute time period that kind of, in your mind, flipped a fortune for the second half? Yeah, um, well, we kind of got in there. We all, And as a team, we all knew what we had to do. We all knew we weren't playing well enough. Or offense or defense, um, and we got in there and we we got in there and we made adjustments to everything that was going on. And I I, th- I felt like that was the biggest thing about that game. Like we got in the locker room and everybody who made a wrong play in that first half adjusted. We all got in there, listened to our coaches, um, and we got in there with each other and we knew what we had to do. You know what I'm saying? We all knew we had a common goal and we all knew we had something to – we had somebody to play for and we had something to, you know what I'm saying, keep going as a as a birth into whatever bowl game we were going to get. We knew we had we had to keep going. So, well, You guys responded coming out of the locker room. Otis had a big fumble in the first half. You had your fumbles and then you come out and hit him 54 yards, the play that everybody remembers when he puts up the peace sign. What do you remember about that play? And take us through it when just in your eyes. Yeah, um, well, like I said, we adjusted in the locker room, and that was one of the kind of the plays that we had came up with that we knew we were kind of going to 
kind of hit in the second half um, on the second down. So when Coach uh, gave us that play, Otis kind of looked at me. He was like, you better throw it. So, <laughs> honestly, I was just doing my job, to be honest. <laughs> I mean, yeah, the safety yeah. kind of screwed that one up, right? Because or he 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 came in way under that. I, honestly, in, in first, I didn't think he was gonna get there at first, but as the ball was still in the air, I'm like, ah, oh, I like I know I didn't throw a pick. <laughs> I always came down with it, and then when I like, cause I I like I throw it, and I'm thinking it's a pick. I'm thinking it's a pick, and I'm thinking it's a pick, and then I see Otis keep running. I'm like, oh, he he must have it. He must got the ball. <laughs> so I kind of ran down there, and then after that. I mean, it changed the whole momentum of the game, and it turned into the DJ Max show. You were running in four yard touchdowns four times after that. What was it about that play? Like they couldn't stop it down at the goal line. Yeah, it was uh, it was the same counter play, which is funny. We just <laughs> added emotion to it a couple of times, but it was the same play. But uh, one of the linebackers just kept he kept overlapping the gap, so I knew if he overlapped the gap. Um, like when he's trying to run over, I knew every time he was going to miss me. So I kind of was just going to sit there and wait for him to overlap it every time. One of the times he almost got me. He almost, uh, he okey doked me. He jumped in the hole and he jumped out of the hole and he almost got me. But yeah, he kept overlapping the play. So uh, like I'll get a call in after, like after we ran it the first time, he'll call me down. He said, look, like if we get back down there, we're going to run the same play. So I got. <laughs> I was just, like I said, man, I just tried to go in there and try, I was just trying to do the best I could. Yeah, if they can't stop it, keep running it. Do you ever stop? Sure. Like, do you ever stop and pinch yourself? You had six touchdowns in, in that conference championship game, uh, which I think is still some, some, of a, uh, some form of a UCF record. Do you ever stop and like pinch yourself to believe that under all the circumstances after the first half, after the turnovers, that you came back and scored six touchdowns to lead us to victory that day? Like, does that still seem real? Does that seem real to you? Um, like, like I said earlier, I still like, I, I guess I don't really understand like what, how, like how big it was. Like, I, I didn't understand until recently just kind of coming back, coming back around UCF and, you know, seeing people that I've, that I know that I've seen recently, like uh, in the past and everything like that. And they remember what I've done. Like, so I think that's the biggest thing to me. Like I, when people tell me about stuff like from 2018, 2017, it's kind of like, how do you even remember I did that? That's how I kind of think of it. But um, it's a it's honestly a blessing. I didn't expect that it was going to be me um, going into going into that year, to be honest. And uh, when I got the opportunity, I was just trying to just trying to do the best that I could. I was just trying. To, I knew I went in and put in the work in every week, um, like I was a starter, and uh, I was happy for the opportunity. And I just didn't want to, you know, kind of squander it. So. Yeah, I'm not just saying this because you're sitting across from us, but that literally is one of the most iconic performances in UCF history. I mean, hands down, when people think about that game, think about that season, that that's literally one of the most iconic performances. But then all of a sudden, we're undefeated, heading to the Fiesta Bowl, playing against LSU, obviously an SEC team. What we now know was a ton of talent on that team, right? That next season, they came back, and they basically were the best yeah, team more... maybe ever in college football. Yeah, I was right? about to say, I think, I, right? I, think it's, I think it's up for sure. Like it's either them or like two thousand one Miami. Like they're, they're probably yeah, the top those, two that, those are teams. Only, it's only a couple arguments. Miami that year, um, USC with Reggie. But it's only a couple teams that could. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? That could compete with that team for sure. Yeah, there's there's less than there's less than five that probably yeah, are on that sure, list. Sure. What was that preparation like that week heading heading into the Fiesta Bowl? Obviously, you had a couple of weeks before the bowl game, but you know, obviously, you know who you're facing. You know, you're the starter, undefeated season on the line, second, you know, second New Year's six bowl game back to back. Take us kind of in the preparation for you and the team that week, you know, as you get to Arizona, as you're kind of leading up to the Fiesta Bowl. Right. Um, well, as a team, we just knew like uh we're kind of just getting a, another opportunity handed to us. And uh, we just, we really just wanted to make the most of our opportunity. That was our biggest thing. Like through those two years, we knew we, we knew we had uh, like only specific uh, like opportunities to show the nation what we were doing at UCF. And we knew that was one of them. And uh, like, I, like I said, we just try to go in there and try to treat it like any other week, because we knew if we treated it like any other week, if we went in there and did, you know what I'm saying? Prepare the way we prepared the, the past 12 weeks that we were going to be fine. So that was kind of our biggest thing. We didn't want to get caught up in the moment. Did, did you guys have a chip on your shoulder? Obviously, we weren't getting any respect from the college football mm -hmm. playoff committee, right? We weren't getting ranked anywhere near, you know, that top half. Was there still a chip on the shoulder of the guys at that point? 2017, we get jobs, not getting an opportunity. We, we all still playing with a chip on your shoulder at that point? Right. Um, 
as far as like the media goes and things like that, I can honestly say through those two years, like me me coming in the locker room every day and me, you know, being a, a UCF player for those two years that we were not losing. Like we weren't even like I can I can't I don't think I can remember any time us coming in the locker room and like talking about like, wow, can you believe they didn't rank us in front of like it wasn't it wasn't about that. We knew our biggest thing is we wanted to show the talent that we had. Like we knew we had the talent, like the, some of the most talented guys in the in the nation, to be honest, at receiver. We had the fastest guys at running back. We had the best guys at quarterback. Our O line was crazy. Our defense was crazier. <laughs> like it was a lot of things. And we just we really wanted to respect for ourselves because we knew how hard we were working and we knew how good we were. So that was kind of our thing. We just wanted to show how we just wanted to show everybody how good we were. We went toe to toe with that team. It came down sure. to the end. For uh, sure. There's got there's a couple plays that stick out to me. Are there any that you would like to have back from that game? Have back from that game. Yeah. Um we ran a like a little slot fade slot fade with Trey Nixon. Um I forgot which way we were going. I think we were going in. We were going into LSU's end zone, and we ran a little slot fade with Trey, and I threw a bad ball. It could have been an easy touchdown. It could have changed. I think we were we – were, I'm trying to think about what half that was in. Might have been the second half, but, yeah, I missed a – I missed a – and Trey's fast, and I could have, I should have just let him. I was trying to get the ball and just baby the ball. You threw one of the nicest passes ever right before the half and hit Gabe right at the back of the end zone. That was beautiful. Right. Yeah. And then he doesn't drop many, but he dropped that one when the guy swiped. It should have been pass interference. They didn't call it, but still hit him right in the hands. That one kind of hurt. I went and, I went and golf. I golf with KZ, Gabe, and Marlon. I want to say Friday, and we act. We we talked. Me and Gabe talked about that. We're all good though, man. I know. Gabe, I know how hard Gabe works, and I know for a fact that that would never. You know what I'm saying? Like if I threw that same ball, like even then when I seen it go through his hands, I knew if I threw it to him again, it would it would never happen. So. It, we were, you know what I'm saying? I never blinked, batted an eye about it. We were kind of good right then. I was just, I honestly was trying to calm Gabe down because Gabe doesn't drop passes and stuff like that. So Gabe's going to get mad at himself. You know what I'm saying? I'm trying to, like, all right, Gabe, we're good. You know what I'm saying? I know that's not going to happen again. I was trying to show him that, you know, I, I you know what I'm saying? I wouldn't lose confidence in him. So, yeah, that still burns him up, I'm sure, to this day. <laughs> I'm pretty, cause he, he, it doesn't happen a lot. So, <laughs> well, what was the locker room like after that game? So we went two years in a row without losing. And then finally, you know, we took one on the chin. But what was it like? Were people sad? Were people kind of relieved that it was over? Take us there. Um, as all of that was happening after the game, I think we were just, you know what I'm saying? That's the that's the last game. That's the last time you're ever gonna play with that team again. Like that specific team, that exact team with everybody on that roster playing the positions that they play. That's the last time that you're going to, you know, be with those guys. And at that time we were a pretty special group. So we were, we were, we were close. So uh, I think our hardest things was just in that locker room, you know what I'm saying? Hugging your brothers for one last time, suiting up with your brothers from one last time, you know, throughout that whole week. Like, so at that time, all of the emotions kind of trickled down to, to the locker room. So you know what I'm saying? Everybody was you know what I'm saying emotional because not because we lost, but that 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 this was the last time that we played with that team and we and we didn't accomplish what we had to do. So so that offseason, uh UCF obviously brings in two quarterbacks. We bring in Brandon Wimbush from the transfer portal. Obviously, Dylan Gabriel signs with us out of high school. Um, what was the QB situation as you understood it going into 2019? Was it gonna be an open competition between the three of you? Were you kind of led to believe, or did you think maybe you had earned QB one and that they they were essentially gonna come back for, you know and, and back you up? How how was that QB situation kind of handled or or how were you kind of led to believe that QB situation would be handled going into 2019? I mean, well, watching Dylan coming out of high school, I knew Dylan was going to be a great talent. And then Brandon had did what he did at Notre Dame. So I knew they were bringing in two quality guys. So I, I would never want to, you know, go into somewhere thinking that I was going to be the guy or, you know what I'm saying? So um, I just, from what I understood, I knew it was going to be a competition. And uh, just from my my respect for those guys, I knew I was going to have to go in and, you know what I'm saying, try to, you know, work very hard to, you know, be better than those guys. And then off season, you get injured. Um, can you tell us more about that injury and sort of what happened and how, if anything, you think that impacted kind of your your springboard into that 2019 sort of fall camp? Yeah, for sure. Well, I felt like that injury, just the timing of it, 
because uh, that was my what at that time I started in three games, my my in my college career. So I was kind of getting my feet wet, you know, and and actually getting reps in the game. So uh, I feel like it hurt that because I was ready to go into that season and just try to take those reps from the games and really just try to hone it in on my my overall just quarterback ability, you know, going into that next spring and going into that next summer. But man, it hurts. You know what I'm saying that it happened. But I knew, I knew um like when it happened, I kind of knew that we were like the guys that I was working with every day that I was, you know what I'm saying, kind of competing with. I knew we all were, you know what I'm saying, capable of going in and playing well. And that was a it was an ankle, correct? You ended up yeah, with a ankle. was it a broken ankle? Yeah, my broken broken left ankle. And how, like, when did that happen and how long was the recovery time? So how much time did you have to kind of maybe recover and get ready for a football season? Um, it happened in the end of June. And I got surgery the first week. of Yeah, I got surgery at the end of the first week of July. And it was about six weeks, like, for me to start running and cutting and everything like that at full speed. So, yeah, about six to eight weeks. I suited up. My first game suiting up was the the Stanford game that year. And what were the coaches' reactions when obviously you had to tell them when they kind of learned about your injury? What was kind of the reaction when when that when you had to share that news? Um, of course, just hearing that one of your players got injured, you're you know what I'm saying kind of sick about it, and you know what I'm saying. But they just told me that I was going to have to work hard to you know make my ankle feel you know normal again. That was their biggest concern, just making sure my ankle felt normal again. So it just after that, um, after surgery, I was back in, you know, just trying to they were just trying to keep me, you know, what I'm saying calm and keep everything was just make sure make sure I was going to come back to normal and not have any hiccups. I'm going to ask you an impossible question to answer, but if you don't have that injury, do you think you, the 2019 season is different for you? Do you think you get that chance to be the starter? Do you think you get a chance to play a little bit more if that injury never happens? Um, I definitely think I probably play get a little bit more because at that point um, I showed kind of what I could do for our offense. So I definitely think they were going to, even if I wasn't named a starter, like I think I would have definitely played ways, you know what I'm saying, to help the offense. So I definitely would have played more that year. Early against the team that we kind of needed me against to play against. Yeah, they kind of made a, a new role for you where you come in on short yardage, things like that. But you feel like you probably – maybe they should have brought you in in that Cincinnati game or maybe that the Tulsa game where things were going too well. Those kind of things are hard to say just because you – like I could have gotten a game and probably, you know what I'm saying, did worse or anything like that. So um, being in those moments, um, I don't think I was really thinking that just because, like I said, you, in, in, in competition you develop a lot of relationships with guys. And uh, like I said, at that point, Dylan was very close to me. Dylan was like my little brother. So I was just really trying to – He's coming off the when he's coming off the field, you're just trying to make sure that he's good. Like, cause at the end of the day, he he's the one that got to go back out there and keep playing. So I was just trying to make sure that he was good. Um, and I knew I, I knew it wasn't anything that he could have done. You know what I'm saying? A lot differently. I knew he, you know, what I'm saying went out there and did his best. So I don't think I don't necessarily think like that. But I think I would have helped the situation more. But but how did you? embrace that role like you knew you were going to be used in short yardage and mm -hmm. you had some big plays too there was one there at the end of the two lane game where you, it was a big fourth down that you came in on yep to so, yeah yeah um yeah like i said I, I went into every game trying to prepare like i was going to play the whole game so um just trying to take the the like a new role because now you got your own packages that you got to worry about and now you got you know saying certain things like that um, I was just trying to go out there and really just um, like do the most that I could when I was in a game, like do the best that I could when I was in a game because I knew I was only going to get ample opportunities. So, DJ, I don't know if we know this. Were you the backup that season? Obviously, uh, Wimbush started game one, and then Dylan took over at the FAU game and played the rest of the season. Were you the backup? So if something had happened to Dylan, were you QB two at that 2019 season? Yeah, would you that, have been the I one think that at in? that point, if something would have happened to Dylan, I think I would have been the one ended up going it. Uh, yeah. Gotcha. So 2019, obviously, um, you know, obviously we lose to LSU in the Fiesta Bowl, but we go to Pitt. They run that stupid BS, the Philly special situation, right? And went on the goal line. They print the shirts. Everyone's really happy. But that's the Pitt first. Loves the CDC offense. <laughs> that's the first regular season loss that you would experience in your time in UCF. A mm -hmm. two-year streak comes to an end. You and a handful of other guys have been there for all of those games. 
what were your emotions after that? I know obviously we lose in the Fiesta Bowl, but first regular season loss. I know at some point, like you said, you took pride in how well you all played and showing everybody how good you are. What was that loss like in the locker room after losing that first one in the regular season? Um, it was um, I want to say it was tough because at that point in time in college football, um, like the guys that were there from 2017 year and 2018 year, like we're kind of the older guys now. So we kind of forgot how it was to, you know what I'm saying, kind of lose. So uh, when it, when we got into the locker room, kind of sat in there for a little bit. We kind of sat in it, you know what I'm saying, just <laughs> guys that don't like to lose, you know what I'm saying, you know, it's, it's, it's like that. Because we, we, we you can't say you go undefeated two straight years and the first time you lose, you're not mad, at, you know what I'm saying, at the game. Mm -hmm. But we knew from that moment that, uh, like, the leaders had to step up and really just keep everybody – Calm, make sure everybody didn't lose their wits, and uh, just we got back to plan, get back to practicing hard that next week. Obviously, again, two seasons at UCF, you lose one game, and we lose three games in 2019. That pit game, the game at Cincinnati, and a, a head scratcher to Tulsa. Tulsa always seemed to have our number for whatever reason, right? Yeah. But that head scratcher at Tulsa. When you look back on that 2019 season, if somebody asked you to describe the 2019 season, how would you describe what that experience was like for you? Um. Well, for me, it was a good experience because – like I said, our first two years we were kind of spoiled. Like a lot of a lot of people in the college football world don't don't get the experience to never come in a locker room with an L. You know what I'm saying? Or to have to hear their coaches talk about an L after a game. Like a lot like a lot of guys, like one L a year, two L's a year. Like that's kind of normal. You know what I'm saying? In the college football world. So for us to have that, it was kind of like a big thing because we learned we learned more. I, I want to say we learned more that year than we did in the, in the in the two years that we were undefeated because we knew like a losing like coming in after an L, you learn a lot more about yourself than you would. You know what I'm saying after a, after a win. That next year, COVID comes around. 2020, nobody knows what the heck's going on. You decided to opt out. What went into that decision? Yeah, um, well, my biggest name is my family at that time. Um, my mom was, you know, kind of susceptible to, you know, COVID at that time. And at that, we really didn't know what was going on. We didn't know how you were going to get it. We didn't know if it was, you know what I'm saying, through the, through any type of touch or, you know what I'm saying. So at that time, I was just scared, um, you know what I'm saying, kind of just trying to protect my mom, make sure everybody in my family was going to be good, that I wasn't going out there and uh, – like hiding in the chances to, 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 to get it. So what were you doing just on your own to stay in football shape during that time? You weren't with the team, right? Yeah, no, I wasn't with the team, but at that time, uh, just trying to go out there with guys, throw, throw as much as I could, just keep my arm ready, just to keep my arm, uh, like in shape. Cause, uh, your arm can get sore if you don't throw for a while. So I was trying to keep my arm in shape, trying to keep my, you know, my body in shape. So yeah, just, how, no, you know how that. weird how weird was it for you to watch your team play and you not be yeah. in the sideline be a part of that? How how weird was that? It's weird because you know when you play football for 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 a long time, uh, like the first year that you're out of it, it just seems weird. Like Saturdays, Saturdays, I kind of woke up and just kind of looked around. Like I'm still in my room. I'm not at the hotel. I don't have anything to do today. Like so that was that was weird to me. But um, and then another thing just just missing the interactions like with your guys that you just go in the locker room 15 minutes before. Like we used to go in the locker room way earlier than we were supposed to like uh, just wake up time. We'll wake up way earlier to get in the locker room just so we could all be around each other. I think that's the part that I, that I miss the most. What kind of fan are you? Are you yelling at the TV when someone does something? Or are you, you jumping up and down? Are you pacing? What kind of fan is DJ Mack watching UCF play in that 2020 season? Yeah, I'm the I'm the I'm the pacing guy. I'm usually the guy that's pacing in the back of the room, not saying much, but just trying to you know, <laughs> trying to coach from the coach from the TV. That's the type of coach I am. But yeah, I'm definitely pacing. I'm you know I'm saying I'm, I yeah I'm definitely one of those fans, especially when I'm watching my guys for sure. Were you staying in touch with the guys? Were you like texting Dylan after a game, like, hey man, yeah, like always. in that second and three, you should have done this. Like, were you still kind of trying to be that big brother, that coach, even though you weren't there every day? Right, I was just trying to. Cause uh, like I said, at that point we were all brothers. So I was trying to keep in touch with my brothers, make sure, you know what I'm saying? I could help out from what I could do from just, you know, watching the, watching the games and things like that. But yeah, we always kept in touch. 
Obviously, that season comes to an end, DJ, and you made the decision at that point that you were going to transfer, you're going to leave UCF. You still had two years of eligibility left at that point. Mm -hmm. Kind of take us into your thought process. What went into your decision um, and what ultimately decided for you that you felt like the best thing for you was to leave UCF? Yeah, um, well, I felt like I had was like from the time that I came in from high school to to that year before code, I felt like I took very long strides in my development as a quarterback. Um, I felt like I worked. I worked very hard in what I was doing, and I felt like I kind of owed myself the opportunity to, to, you know, just to go try to, you know, what I'm saying, go be a, go be the guy somewhere. I knew Dylan was kind of coming into you. You kind of felt that Dylan was coming to his own. You know, what I'm saying as a player, we kind of knew what type of talent we had. Um, and yeah, like I said, I felt like I just owed myself that that opportunity to go try. How does that process work? Like, do you, do you call Coach Heupel and say, hey, I, I got to talk to you? Like, obviously, again, you weren't around the team at that point. Yeah. How does that process work for you when you make that decision? Who do you reach out to? How do you kind of go about getting in the portal and figuring out where your next stop is? Right. Well, throughout that year, we were still kind of um, just chatting. Like, Coach Heupel would text me every now and again just to, you know, check on me, check on my son and different things like that. So, um, like, we will always keep in touch throughout that year. And then uh, kind of – towards I want to say probably like that last week I, I asked him could I talk to him and he kind of kind of understood you know what I'm saying he, and he definitely uh, helped me out a lot so ultimately you decided to go to Old Dominion back closer to home right was that one of the big factors in making that decision yeah definitely more of like a comfortability factor you know what I'm saying as a as an older guy you don't want to you know travel too many from too too many unfamiliar places so um, yeah, being able to be back close to home was something that was kind of, you know, special to me because I always wanted to, like the guys that I played with in high school, you know, different things like that. I wanted those, I always wanted those guys to be able to be in arms reach coming to games and different things like that. So that was, uh, that was pretty special to me. How was that whole experience up there? You enjoyed it? Yeah, I definitely enjoyed it. I learned a, like in, in times where, you know what I'm saying? You're older and you go, like I said, to new places like that, being around new programs, you learn a lot. So I had the, the opportunity to learn a lot from uh, different coaches. So um, I just tried to take everything that I learned in stride and just uh, like further develop me as a man before I, you know, kind of graduated and got done, got back into, you know, kind of, you know, real life. So what's next for you? You going to get a job? You're going to, you want to get into coaching? You want to stay man, uh, I've been thinking about coaching. I don't know if I want to get into college coaching just yet, but I'm definitely going to uh, try to try, try to work my way into coaching. Um, like I said, I'm a, I'm a guy that loves, like I love the small things about football. I love, like I said, being able to go into the locker room and talk to the guys or, you know what I'm saying, seeing, being able to just put a smile on people's face. You know what I'm saying when they see you walk around, different things like that. Those are the things that I like about football, like, or, kind of what you know what i'm saying what i'm passionate about football so as long as i'm staying in a way that i can you know keep building relationships within football i'm, I'm good with it dj one of the coolest things about your time at ucf was also how involved your parents were your mom and dad were at a lot of games uh, active on social media how cool is it that your parents got a chance to be kind of a part of that night nation community and that they got a chance to kind of be around you and everybody else during your time at ucf yeah um well just my whole life, like my, my my mom and my dad have been at every game. You know what I'm saying? Uh, like the only games my dad wasn't at was when he was overseas. Like he got shipped overseas. That was the only game my dad missed. But other than that, like my mom was – my mom, like once uh, – like in high school, I think my mom was in the hospital on Thursday night. I didn't even think she was going to be at – like Friday I'm walking. I see my mom like in a wheelchair like uh, <laughs> a long day. And I'm like, what are you doing here? Like, just things like that. So I knew they were always going to, uh, I always knew that they were going to support me in every, in every kind of move that I made. So having them like being loved, like I was being loved, that, that really meant a lot to me. Cause, uh, just seeing how hard they worked to give me, you know what I'm saying? With the life that I lived and give me that and, you know, be some of the most supporters that I've, that I've ever even seen. You know what I'm saying? I got a lot of friends and things like that. And it's not the same for them. So just having that was kind of a blessing. Like my parents, like, say if their parents weren't there, my parents were there for them. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, just different things like that. Like, my mom used to wear other players' numbers on her face. Like, things like that. So for everybody to see kind of what kind of people they were, you know what I'm saying, and to love on them like they love on me was pretty special. I don't know. You've been around Orlando again recently. I saw you. I saw a picture, I think, of the cheese it Bowl. You and KZ met up yeah. and had a chance to take some pictures. I know you've been back around Orlando a little bit. 
when you think about your time at UCF, if someone asked you to kind of sum up your your career at UCF, how would you how would you describe your experience? Um, a special experience, to be honest. Um, whenever I talk to anybody that's not from Orlando, I just tell them how special Orlando is because it's so much to do, so much to get into. It's but then it's also small enough to where you kind of know who's in your community. You, like like a lot of UCF fans and things like that from that time. Like I still keep relationships with them. Like it's still small enough for that. You know what I'm saying? But it's big enough to to kind of get lost in. You know what I'm saying? So um, unless or Orlando is a special place. Um, it really made me a man. It made me who I am. Uh, I recommend it to everybody all the time. Uh, so on experience, I think it was just – like, I think I feel like Orlando is the best thing that happened to me, to be honest. Like, everything that's came from Orlando came, you know what I'm saying, from me being here. I felt like it's it's definitely a very, very special place to me. All right, DJ, you may be the nicest human being I've ever met in my life. So no, what no, we need no to way. do now is, no is flip the script. Now we're going to ask you some rapid fire questions, right? These could be about music, movies, sports, anything else in the world. All right. So we're going to hit you with some rapid fire, some random questions. Are you ready? Okay. Right. Did you watch the NBA dunk contest on Saturday night? And if so, what did you think of that? Because Mike is of the opinion that dunk contest needs to go. I need I need your opinion here. Dunk contest, keep it or get rid of it. Um I feel like the superstars, I feel like superstars of the NBA should be superstars of the dunk contest. I feel like who, you know what I'm saying, kind of took out their egos and things like that. I feel like dunk contest would be way better. All right, so I, I think he's with Team Mike on this He's one. a VA guy, though. He's a Virginia guy. Okay. So I knew Matt he's got Haas. He's got, he's got Haas for sure. Yeah. His, his highlight videos are, are crazy for sure. Yeah, when we were kids, it was Jordan against Dominique Wilkins. I guess. Yeah, you know, and they were really at each other. Like, now it's 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 a whole different league now. Yeah, and they do all the same dunks every year. So, um, Yeah. <laughs> it's hard, it's, it's kind of hard to get creative with those things, though. Yeah. What yeah. can you do? There's nothing else to do. Um, you are a father now. Right. And when we were kids, there was a group called Criss Cross. They used to call each other the Daddy Mac and the Mac Daddy. Which one are you? Which uh, nickname do you prefer? <laughs> um, if I had to choose, I think I'm going to go. I think I'll go Mac Daddy if I had to choose. But I think <laughs> my dad would choose that, too. So I think I would have to choose Daddy Mac. <laughs> All right, DJ, if you had to call one of your former UCF teammates right now and you needed someone just to make you laugh, you just needed one person, you can pick up the phone, call them, and they're going to say something that makes you laugh, makes you smile, just like you just did. Who's the one teammate you want to call? Sterling Jones. Wow, okay. And, yeah, and why, 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 why Sterling Jones? He's probably the funniest guy I've ever met in my life. He's probably the funniest guy I've ever met in my life. What, what, is, I think what would he do? I will tell you that, too. I think a lot of what, people will tell you that. What would he do to make you laugh? He's just funny. Sterling's from Montgomery, Alabama. Like he's he's just he's just funny. Anything that he says, like I can honestly say, like from 2017 to 2020, any day that I seen Sterling and was around him for more than five minutes, I had like a genuine, like from the stomach laugh. That's how yeah. So he's definitely anything that he does is just funny. Like he can be dead serious and he's just hilarious. All right, Mike, note to self, we got to get Sterling Jones on the show. Sterling's <laughs> hilarious. Yeah, Sterling's hilarious. Sterling, Usually, go ahead. No, I was going to say, a lot of people say Mark Rucker is one of the funnier guys. Mark, he was an older guy, though. Yeah. He was an older guy. I didn't play with him. He was a oh, dumb okay. guy. Yeah, he, I, think, yeah, I he thought was he was dumb. there in 17. No, I guess not. Yeah. 16, yeah. 17, 16. Yeah. All right, so uh, what, what song do you listen to before a big game to get you hyped up? Um, recently for like the past two years, I've been a big raw wave guy, but when I was at UCF, um, dang, I probably don't even know. Probably like a, at that time, back then, I was probably like a little Uzi Vert. I used to listen to a lot of him when I was in high school, coming out of high school and stuff like that. So probably, probably him. All right, on the show, DJ, we used to have a little fun with Coach Heupel and all of his different what we called hypalisms, right? Snap to whistle, you know, three phases of the game. Like he had all these like cliche sayings. <laughs> Did you all think that was funny too? Did you guys kind of roll your eyes and laugh a little bit when he would hit you Always. with snap to whistle, get Always. to the grass, all that stuff? Coach Hype, so we used to have Coach Hype used to have this little thing he does. Like he used to just do this, like snap and point. 
and we used to count how many times he did it in a meeting. Like it was like a big thing. Like somebody had to count it because he we knew that he was gonna do it. You feel me? Yeah, that, that, <laughs> you, feel me? Exactly, you feel me? That's that's exactly what Coach Hart does. And he does it all the time. Like so, we definitely kept that count. Which which one of your teammates did the best Coach Heupel impression? Oh, man, probably KZ. KZ's hypo impression is really good. KZ's hypo okay. impression is very good. All right, I'm going to write that down. All right, as a father now, you watch a lot of baby shows and movies, I'm sure. What's your favorite Disney movie or just any kiddie movie you've been watching lately? Um, Octonauts. I watch uh, probably Octonauts probably Octonauts. all day. Yeah, that's the one. <laughs> Octonauts and my son's big on Ninja Turtles right now, so those are <laughs> okay. Awesome. that's that's what we're watching on TV. Those are those are two things that I can't really, you know, what I'm saying get tired of. Is it old school Ninja Turtles or is it three branded? It's new stuff. Right? I don't, it's on Netflix, and if it says Ninja Turtles, my son wants it. I just tell you that much. So <laughs> I don't. I can't honestly couldn't tell you. All right, take me back to peak DJ Mac football career. How far could you have thrown a football? What's the furthest distance you think you could you could throw? Um, probably like my senior year, I did a high school competition. I probably threw it like 67 yards. So probably like my, like my third year in college, I probably could throw it like probably like 70, 75. Did you have the strongest arm amongst the QBs at that point? No. Quadri Jones. Anybody wow. would tell anybody from those years will tell you that it's quad for sure. For sure. Where does, where does, where does Brandon Winbush fall on that scale? Probably, probably second or third. Okay. Yeah. He had some accuracy issues, though. No, I mean, his, his accuracy wasn't always there. Brandon was so strong. Like, it's <laughs> ridiculous how strong Brandon was. So, I, I can imagine, because he's, just, like I said, Brandon is just so strong. Like, Brandon was probably one of the strongest players on the team. All right, UCF's heading into the Big 12 next season. A lot of people planning road trips. If you had to pick one Big 12 destination you had to go to for a game, where Oklahoma. would you go? Oklahoma, for sure. sure. It's easy. I'm so upset that, they, they're, they're, that they're not coming here this year. I'm so upset. I wanted it so bad. I just Are you going to make that trip? Game. Huh? Are you going to go out there when we play them? I'm definitely trying to. I've been thinking about getting a ticket to go out there. I just got to figure out what uh, what day they play them more. I think I, they did they play them early on in the year? It's in October, I believe, right? What's the October? exact date? I don't you know. Yeah, it's like mid October. It's like the yeah, I, I um, first out, last I game I think after. That game. Seeing Dylan yeah. play in the Cheese Bowl uh, made me want to go. You know, play. seeing him in Lab at Oklahoma made me want to go see him again. So, especially against us. DJ, what are your thoughts on NIL? Obviously, you you, you had the, kind of the tail end of your career. NIL opportunities mm-hmm. were available to you all. What are your thoughts, kind of an NIL now, and kind of what it means for college football? Um, I definitely think it makes college football more of like a like kids are being more strategic nowadays about where they're going to go just because of, you know, the, the opportunities that they can receive. And I feel like, uh, like schools are going to sell NIL a lot more, you know what I'm saying? than their school. Cause at the end of the day, you know what I'm saying? As a child coming out of, <laughs> out of high school, you're going to try to go, go get some money. So I feel like, uh, like that's going to be the biggest thing in recruiting now. Like, I don't really feel like they're going to recruit program, like they're going to recruit. Hey, listen, if you get here, I can get you, you know what I'm saying? I can get you this before, you know what I'm saying? But I, feel, I also feel like uh, like, we, like we deserve it. Like, we go in there every day uh, and just, like I said, really, some days we're in there from six to, six to nine, eight. Sometimes the coaches keep you in there to watch extra film. You're not getting home to ten. So, uh, like I said, it's, it's a ground for all of us, and I like I'm kind of happy that they're that they're being able to experience, you know, what I'm saying, getting paid for who they are. What about dessert? Talk about dessert. Are you a big dessert guy? Do you prefer cake, ice cream? If you had to pick one thing after a nice meal, what are you eating? Probably cake. I'm a big cake guy. Any kind of cake? Birthday cake? Publix red velvet cake. Red velvet's pretty good. That's solid. No, that's a really good choice. Yeah, Publix red velvet cake. I go get. I go get Publix red cake by the uh, red velvet cake by the slice. All right, DJ. So obviously you were at UCF as a player. I'm sure you get a lot of practice gear, right? Shirts, you know, shorts, hats, all that stuff, right? So you have, probably have a nice, nice set of UCF gear, right? Then you go to ODU, 
do you still wear you your UCF stuff? You have to put it in a box until you're done at ODU. What did you do with your UCF stuff while you're at ODU? Can you still rock that? Is that is that okay or how does that work? Okay, so honestly, I'm not gonna lie. Like the stuff that I got while I was at UCF, like just like my workout shirts and you know workout clothes, like were some of the the like the, <laughs> the coolest stuff I've ever seen. So I still like when I'm around the house or say if I'm going out like somewhere. I was still weird if it because like it looked good like I good I look good in it but around the building and stuff I I know I didn't do that <laughs> <laughs> but everywhere else I got my UCF stuff on for sure. Are you coming back to uh, Orlando for any games this year? No, nah, so I actually live in Orlando. Like my oh, yeah? so my second year, yeah, my sophomore year, my parents ended up coming down here and moving down here, and now they have a now they have a house down here and everything. So yeah, I'm I'm planning it in Orlando for sure. So you have season tickets or they kind of just give you tickets? You just walk in and you walk um, into the building and they let you in? I haven't I haven't figured that type of stuff out yet. Um, <laughs> I've been to basketball games, but football wise, I haven't figured that stuff out. I don't know how that stuff goes yet, but I would definitely be, I would definitely be at the home games for sure. Just go in there and point at the banner with the, the Memphis championship game no, and say, hey, would, that, that's my just hold up that. six. Just hold up six. Be like, I had I six touchdowns. That. I'll, we'll I'll stand over like, here. Uh yeah, like, yeah, I don't know who you are. <laughs> <laughs> they asked for your ticket, just point at it. There's yeah. my ticket right there. Yeah, just point at a championship band. I'll get you in yeah. touch with Carlos McCann. So he'll he'll take uh, he'll take good care of you, get you on the sideline, DJ. Okay. But look, yeah, it's, it's been a lot of fun. It's been a lot of fun catching up with you, man. We definitely appreciate you taking so much time out of your schedule to uh, chat with us and talk about your career at UCF. Like I said, just not because you're here, man, but you literally had one of the most iconic performances in UCF history, man. So it's so cool to see you back around Orlando, back around the program. Uh, Hopefully we'll catch you at a game or two this year, man. But uh, I know a lot of Night Nation absolutely loves and respects what you did for UCF, man. And we wish you nothing nothing but the best, man. So be, be well, take care of yourself, take care of your family, man. And hopefully we'll catch up soon, okay? Appreciate you guys. I ain't got enough words for, you know what I'm saying, what Night Nation and you guys have done for me. So thank you guys.